Boiler Lab. They thought their car was malfunctioning, but it turned out to be a strange, smelly object wrapped around the rear axle. Today we will recap the story of the 1990 movie Tremors. A young guy named Val wakes up in the morning in the midst of picturesque nature. He and his older buddy named Earl slept in the back of a pickup truck last night. The two friends are handymen from a small American town called Perfection. Their job this morning is to shepherd a herd of cows. Earl doesn't want to wake up, so Val decides to poke fun at him. He swings the pickup truck around, shouting loudly, Rodeo, make way. Earl in his sleeping bag falls out of the back of the truck and stares in horror at the cows munching peacefully through the grass. Realizing it was a joke, Earl mutters that a real rodeo is no fun. As they continue to poke fun at each other, the boys smoke and argue about who's going to make breakfast today. None of them feel like doing it. Then they play rock paper scissors, Val loses and goes off to cook in frustration, calling his friend a senile old man. Then the guys build a pen for the cows. In doing so, Earl resents that each of their part-time jobs is hard, ungrateful crap that doesn't bring in much money. He would like to give it up and get a proper job, but Val feels that the present situation gives them freedom. Finally, the fence is set, and the friends head home. Another exciting job awaits them today, garbage collection. This doesn't make the guys particularly happy, but they have no other options. Before they reach town, they spot a girl in the middle of the prairie. Val cheers up and steers the car toward her, hoping to see the beauty of his dreams. But the girl doesn't live up to his expectations. She turns out to be a student named Rhonda. The girl is studying seismology and came to this region to investigate vibrations in the ground. Lately, something strange has been happening here. Earl smiles sweetly at Rhonda and promises to help if he can. But Val remains indifferent and turns the car around toward town. Soon the boys reach perfection. Its population is only 14 people. The guys park in front of the only coffee shop and go inside. Here they meet a shopkeeper named Walter and a married couple, Berta and Heather. These two are survivalists and are constantly preparing for all sorts of disasters. All the locals already know about Rhonda's arrival and her research. Meanwhile, out in the prairie, the ground begins to shake. Rhonda sets up seismographs everywhere to use their readings to calculate the strength of the tremors. Then the sand grows increasingly shaky, as if some subterranean creature wants to catch Rhonda. But the girl doesn't notice anything. She gets into her car and safely drives on. Earl and Val use the dump truck to take the garbage to the dump. Afterward, they relax, sitting on old furniture right in the middle of the landfill. The guys feel that they have hit rock bottom and it's time to get their lives back on track. But for some reason they decided to start with sanitation jobs. Earl says he can't take it and is ready to leave perfection right now. Suddenly, sewage from the pipe pours out on the guys, and it strengthens their resolve to move to another town. The friends immediately pack their bags and set off toward the road out of perfection. On the way they are stopped by a local woman named Nancy. She offers the boys a lucrative job and a beer on her dime, but they refuse the tempting offer and continue on to the nearby big town of Bixby. The lads are sure that nothing else will keep them in perfection. However, as they drive out of town, they spot a local drifter who has climbed a high voltage tower for some reason. The old man doesn't respond to the boys' cries, and they decide to take the poor guy down. Val loses his rock paper scissors again, which means he has to climb up. Upon reaching the old man, Val realizes that he has passed away. The doctor who arrives declares that the mishap was caused by dehydration. It turns out that the old man had been sitting on the tower for three or four days, and all that time for some reason he couldn't get off. Meanwhile, a local farmer named Fred is working in his vegetable garden. Suddenly, his sheep begin to frantically rush around the paddock. Then something attacks the man and drags him underground. Our protagonists do not give up hope of leaving perfection. On their way out of town, they discuss who could have chased the drifter up the tower and not let him come down for days. This is extremely odd, considering that the unfortunate man had a loaded shotgun in his hands. With this talk, the boys pull up to Fred's desolate farm. His sheep have been wiped out, and the man himself is nowhere to be seen. Val notices a farmer's hat in the bed, and underneath it is his head. This find causes Earl and Val to return to perfection again. On the way, they meet road workers and yell at them to get out of here. But the workers don't take their words seriously and keep chiseling away at the asphalt. Suddenly, the jackhammer hits something soft and a red substance flows out from under the asphalt. Something underground drags the tool from the worker's hands and crawls toward the stone embankment. The man's foot gets entangled in the wire, and he is dragged along by an unknown force. The result is a rock slide that takes the lives of the workers. Val and Earl return to perfection and go into Walter's cafe, because there is a phone here that can be used to call the police. But the phone doesn't work. So the guys have to go to Bixby to contact the police there after all. This is the third time today they've tried to leave perfection, but this time they're blocked by a rock slide. Val can barely stop the car in time to avoid hitting the obstruction. While looking over the rubble, Earl finds what's left of the workers, and the guys decide to get the hell out of there. Val tries to turn the car around, but it gets caught on something and struggles to move out of the way. 
Bickering about Val's inability to drive, the friends head back to Walter's cafe. All the locals have already gathered here. Bert notices that the guy's car has some strange stuff wrapped around the rear axle. The man carefully removes it with a shovel, and it turns out to be a piece of a very smelly snake. It was the snake that had snagged on the car and was preventing it from moving. Walter immediately decides to buy the snake from the guys for $5. During the bidding process, they manage to scam the peddler out of $15. Bert thinks they are dealing with a mutated strong snake, but it couldn't have eaten Fred and the others by itself. So, there might be a lot of snakes like that around the area. Night falls. The doctor, who came in the afternoon to examine the deceased old man from the tower, has not yet made it to his home in Bixby. So, he and his wife settled down for the night in a trailer in the middle of the prairie near perfection. Suddenly their generator goes out. The doctor wants to fix it, but the generator seems to have fallen underground, leaving only the stripped end of a wire. Then a pillar of dust erupts from the ground along with the chewed up generator. The doctor's wife wants to hurry into town, but the man slows down. Suddenly an unknown force begins to pull him underground. The woman tries to save her husband, but she is not strong enough, and the unfortunate man sinks headlong into the sand. Suddenly the head of a vile snake appears in the pit. The woman, terrified, runs to the car and locks herself inside, while accidentally turning on the radio. The keys to the car are left with the doctor, and three snakes loom outside the window. The creepers try to chew through the glass, but fortunately they don't succeed. The car starts to shake and the back of the car gradually sinks under the ground. In desperation, the woman turns on her headlights, trying to signal. The car's windows crack and it sinks completely into the sand. In perfection, all the locals spend the night at Walter's coffee shop. The kids take pictures with bits of the snake, and the adults discuss a pest control plan. Bert suggests that everyone get guns, cordon off the town, and start a snake hunt. The housewife, Nancy, thinks it makes more sense to use Walter's walkie-talkie and contact the police from Bixby. But perfection is surrounded on three sides by mountains, and the radio signal won't get through. Neither can you get to Bixby on foot, because it is 60 kilometers away. That's when everyone remembers that Walter has some horses that can be ridden to Bixby for help. Earl and Val turn out to be the best riders, so the next morning they saddle their horses and get ready to leave. Everyone wishes them luck, and the survivalists even give them their guns. Now Earl and Val are the only hope for the people of perfection. Soon the boys pull up to the doctor's empty trailer on the road to Bixby. They don't find the car, so they think the doctor and his wife have gone home after all. But Val is disturbed by the music playing from the radio. The guys go to the sound, and find the car mired in the sand. Only the glowing headlights are visible. The friends continue on their way to Bixby, discussing the insatiable critters that killed the doctor. Suddenly the horses stop obeying the riders and want to turn back. They seem to smell something. The horses then throw the guys off and try to gallop away, but they are attacked by snakes right out of the ground. Val shoots one and it hides in the sand. That's when the ground rises under the guys. They run off the place, and a huge fat worm bursts out of the sand. The three little snakes turn out to be nothing but offshoots from its mouth. A frightened Val shoots at the monster, but it's no use. So, the guys quickly run away, but the giant worm goes underground and follows them at breakneck speed. The path of the friends is blocked by a wide concrete canal. They try to jump over it, but are unable to. The worm wants to catch its prey and crashes at speed into the thick concrete wall. This turns out to be his fatal mistake. The worm has now been neutralized. Stupid son bitch. Suddenly Rhonda comes up to the guys and cheerfully asks if they have seen anything unusual. But then she notices a piece of the worm through a hole in the concrete herself. Using poles, the friends dismantle part of the wall, and the ugly worm's head is revealed in all its glory. The animal stinks terribly, and Rhonda notices that it has no eyes. The snake-like tentacles in its mouth are adapted to grab its prey and pull it into the monster's mouth. Rhonda believes the discovery of the worm is the biggest discovery in zoology of the 20th century. Meanwhile, Val unearths the rest of the worm. The monster is enormous. It was its movements underground that the seismographs responded to, and the worm was able to crawl so fast because of the long teeth that dotted its entire body. Suddenly Rhonda realizes something and rushes to her notes. The guys, meanwhile, speculate that they have made a real discovery, for which they will become famous and get a tidy sum. The friends are already planning to drive a truck to the site, load the monster, and deliver it to the big city. But their fantasies are interrupted by Rhonda. The previous day, the seismographs picked up vibrations from the worms in four different places at the same time. That means there are three more monsters crawling around somewhere. The friends realize that they urgently need to get away in Rhonda's car, which is standing nearby. At that moment, the seismograph detects underground activity nearby. The friends quickly climb onto the pile of rocks, and for good reason, as predatory worm sprouts immediately show up from under the ground. Now Rhonda's car is not so easy to reach. The worm realizes that dinner has temporarily eluded it, and hides in the sand. The friends decide to wait for the worm to crawl away before continuing on their way. Val and Earl speculate where these monsters might have come from. Coming from outer space or mutating from radiation. 
Rhonda, on the other hand, believes that such worms appeared on Earth 2 billion years ago, although people have not yet seen them. An hour passes, and it's time to see if the worm is gone. Vel steps down and pokes a stick in the sand, resenting the fact that he always gets the dirty work. The monster's offshoot immediately shows up on the surface and bites into the stick. Val climbs up in terror. It turns out that the worm can wait a long time for its prey. It has no eyes and no sense of smell, so it picks up vibrations from human movement. It looks like the friends are trapped on the rock. Soon it gets dark, and everyone goes to bed. In the morning, Val wakes up and sees Rhonda nestled against his shoulder as he sleeps. The embarrassed guy quickly moves away from the student. Rhonda also wakes up and gives him the jacket she used to cover herself with during the night. The friends hope the worm has already crawled away. But when Val throws a shovel into the sand, the monster shows its presence. Now the guys understand how the worm made the old drifter sit for four days on the electric tower. Suddenly Rhonda has an idea, but the guys argue and don't listen to her. Then the girl finds a long wooden pole on her own and easily jumps onto a nearby boulder. Her car can be reached through a bunch of these rocks by jumping from one to the other. Earl immediately follows Rhonda's example with gusto, but he does it rather clumsily. However, with practice, they leap from rock to rock with ease. One last dash is all that remains. They need to jump into the back of the car and drive away immediately. But the monster doesn't sleep. As Rhonda starts the car, hanging upside down, the worm attacks the party from all sides. Finally, the truck pulls away, and the friends head for perfection. When they arrive at Walter's store, they warn the gathered crowd of the danger that looms over everyone. But not everyone believes in the existence of giant worms. Rhonda cannot explain the monsters scientifically. So Walter gives them a name, the Graboids. The townspeople decide what to do next. There is still hope that help might come to perfection. That would be true, except that a car approaching the town gets stuck near the rock slide. The fate of the driver is not hard to guess. At Walter's cafe, Rhonda explains to people that the Graboids attack on sensing the slightest vibration. But to stop making noise is not an option, because life in the city can't stand still, and the monsters are getting closer and closer to perfection. This can be seen by tracing the location of their atrocities on the map. It turns out that the only option to escape is to leave perfection. Rhonda offers the option of leaving the town through the mountains, as the Graboids are unable to penetrate the rock. Meanwhile, local teenager Melvin goes outside and kicks a ball on the ground. Sensing the vibration, a Graboid crawls up to him and eats the ball. Everyone runs outside to the teenager's scream. He climbs up a lamppost out of fear. Under the crowd's feet something begins to stir, and a Graboid emerges from the ground. Trying to evade the monster, everyone returns to the cafe. But the Graboid has already sensed the vibrations, and now it crawls under the building and tests the floor for strength. Everyone tries not to make a sound. Then a strange noise is heard from the street. It's Nancy's daughter riding a jumper across the pavement. At the last moment Val manages to save the child, but the Graboid has managed to sense the vibrations and drag the jumper away. The worm is not satisfied with such a prey, so it continues the hunt. Nancy and her daughter hide in the house, and Val jumps on top of the truck. But it's an unreliable hiding place, the Graboid is about to reach the guy. Suddenly another worm appears nearby. Rhonda tries to escape from it, but stumbles over some barbed wire and falls. The girl's legs get entangled in the wire, and the Graboid is already ready to attack. Rhonda fails to untangle herself and the worm soon drags her away. That's where Val comes to the rescue. He drives a pickaxe into the Graboid's head to distract him, and makes Rhonda take off her pants, for that is the only way to get rid of the wire. There are now two worms in the yard, but the young men still manage to escape and hide in the cafe. There, Val carefully treats the girl's wounds. Then pants and shoes are found for her. The friends need a new plan, though now their car won't go anywhere, because the Graboid ate the tires while it was hunting Val. Suddenly the compressor in Walter's refrigerator starts making a treacherous noise. The guys quickly turn off the refrigerator, but it's too late. Graboid chews through the floor and grabs Walter. The man cannot be saved. A second monster also rams the floor. It's no longer safe to stay inside, and the friends decide to escape to the roof. Rhonda fails to jump to the right shelf in time. The Graboid almost catches up with her, but the girl manages to escape and climb the water tower next to the cafe. Now nearly everyone in town climbs to the roofs of buildings. The couple of survivalists, Bert and Heather, know nothing of what is going on in perfection and calmly return home from their trip across the prairie. As they get out of the car, Heather looks through binoculars and wonders why all the residents are on the rooftops. Bert has a walkie-talkie at home with which he communicates with those left behind at Walter's cafe. Hanging from the roof, Val pulls a walkie-talkie out the window and receives the signal. The guy tells the survivalists about the Graboids, but doesn't have time to tell them not to make any noise. Heather starts the machine, and its noise is heard by the Graboids. Val asks the couple to climb to the roof, but it's too late. The pair manage to grab their guns when a giant worm breaks through the wall of their basement. Bert drops out of contact, but encouraging shots rang out from the direction of his house. The Graboid doesn't care for bullets and grabs Bert's leg while he's reloading, but Heather comes to her husband's rescue. The spouses work well as a pair, 
covering each other's backs. Heather shoots the monster with a flare gun, and Bert manages to get his elephant hunting rifle and defeat the Graboid with a well-aimed shot in its mouth. Broke into the wrong goddamn wreck room, didn't you, you bastard? Now only two worms remain alive. Having won, the joyful couple contact Val and tell him of their success. All residents of the town rejoice and promise not to make any more jokes about the strange couple. Bert and Heather make their way to the roof, as another Graboid has crawled up to their house. The man shoots it in the back with his elephant rifle, but it is useless. The worm's only weakness is its mouth. Meanwhile, the Graboid near the cafe decides to change tactics. It starts to tear down the building, causing the roof to wobble. The worm tests the strength of other houses in the area. Finally, it finds a flimsy van, on the roof of which a local man is trying to escape. Eventually the Graboid throws the man to the ground and disposes of him. Val realizes that they all need to get out of town together. He asks the survivalist to drive up to the cafe and pick them up, then drive off to the mountains. But one of the Graboids seems to guess their idea and breaks the couple's car. Desperate Val thinks that now only a helicopter or a tank can save them. And then Earl remembers the bulldozer, which is used to haul away the garbage. It weighs over 30 tons, something the Graboids can't possibly crush. And the bulldozer's trailer can hold all the city's residents. But the bulldozer still needs to be reached, and for that someone has to run to it on the ground. Then the friends come up with a diversion. They need to start the mini tractor, standing by the cafe, so it would roll on its own and rumble. The Graboids will definitely be distracted by its noise. Earl and Val decide who will run to the bulldozer. They play rock paper scissors, and Val traditionally loses. But his older mate won't let him risk his life and wants to take the mission on himself. However, when their friend starts the tractor, Val abruptly jumps off the roof and runs toward the bulldozer. The monsters do follow the noisy tractor, but it soon collapses on its side in the middle of the road. The Graboids immediately lose interest in it, and start chasing Val. The guy freezes in place a few steps away from the bulldozer. The people on the rooftop start making loud noises to draw the Graboids' attention to themselves and save Val. The guy could really use some help from his friends. Then Rhonda smashes the water tower pipe. The water flows noisily to the ground and attracts the worms. At this point Val gets to the bulldozer and drives to the cafe to pick up his friends. Rhonda is the first one down in the cab, and then the others. Now all the survivors are on their way to Bert and Heather's house. Meanwhile, the couple is on the roof of their house making homemade explosives. They need to hurry, because the Graboids are getting nimbler and attacking the bulldozer every time it stops. And the couple is still figuring out which weapon to take with them. Finally everyone is there, and the bulldozer heads off toward the mountains. Bert and Heather look painfully at their house, which had everything to survive a nuclear war. But the house couldn't protect them from the Graboids. The bulldozer confidently approaches the mountains, the Graboids don't even try to attack it. True, they crawl somewhere nearby and raise pillars of dust, as if they are up to something. As it happens, the bulldozer soon falls into a pit trap that the Graboids have dug. The terrified people climb into the surviving trailer and are amazed at the worm's ingenuity. But the Graboids keep attacking them. Then Bert launches one of his homemade bombs. It scares the worms away, but does not penetrate their armor. Once they come to their senses, the Graboids return to the trailer. Staying in it is dangerous. Then Rhonda notices a pile of rocks nearby and suggests running there. But first, another bomb must be detonated to scare the Graboids away again. Bert does just that. After the explosion, the people take advantage of the worm's confusion and quickly run to the rocks. Fortunately, the plan works, the Graboids don't have time to orient and catch their prey. But when the people climb the boulder, the monsters surround them. Getting to the mountains from here is unrealistic, because there simply aren't enough bombs to scare the worms away all the way. The survivalists immediately realize that they are trapped, because there is no water or food on the rocks, which means that everyone will soon perish. Conflict erupts between Bert and Val on that basis, but the others quickly calm them down. The friends have no new plan, so everyone just sits on the rock. Bert says that when he starts to starve, he will light the fuse on the bomb and go down to the Graboids. The man hopes to get the bomb to the worm right down his throat in this way. These words inspire Earl with a brilliant idea. He decides to set up some sort of Graboid fishing bait. Val and Rhonda toss rocks into the ground to attract the worm. And Earl ties a bomb to a rope, lights the fuse, and throws it where the Graboid is supposed to come from. His plan works. The worm swallows the bomb, there is an explosion, and the monster is blown to pieces. But another monster remains. He is baited in the same way, and now Val drops the bomb. The Graboid swallows the bait, but immediately spits it out right on the rock where the company is hiding. The projectile hits the backpack where the other bombs are. There is a huge explosion. The only surviving bomb is in Val's hands. But during the explosion, Earl, Val and Rhonda fall off a rock to the ground. The Graboid senses them and crawls closer. Those who remain on the rock manage to distract it, but this can't go on and they need to put an end to the worm once and for all. All that remains is to decide how to properly use the last bomb. 
Suddenly Val starts running and screaming with the bomb in his hands. The Graboid immediately gets active. Earl and Rhonda have no choice but to run away from the worm following Val. The two friends run to the edge of the cliff and wait for the Graboid to approach. Val shortens the bomb's fuse, sets it on fire and throws it at the worm. The guy misses slightly, and the distraught Graboid rushes towards Val at breakneck speed. Rhonda and Earl run away, Val waits for the worm to get closer and jumps over it. The Graboid, on the other hand, plunges off a high cliff and falls to the bottom of the ravine. Now the monsters are definitely finished. The people admire Val's bravery and are able to return home. The time goes by. Val and Earl heal their wounds and are once again about to leave for Bixby. Rhonda, too, is leaving soon for school. As she says goodbye, she takes a picture of the guys and thanks Val for saving her life. Embarrassed, the girl tries to ask him out on a date, but the guy is hesitant to reciprocate. When Rhonda leaves, Val can't resist and runs after her. He doesn't believe that their relationship has a future because they are from different worlds, but he kisses the girl nonetheless. So, what did you think of this movie? Leave it in the comments below and if you liked the video please like and subscribe for more movie recaps. See you next time.